Let's Review, a daily program that delves into the latest and most significant economic stories. From stock markets to currency news, Business Review covers the most up-to-date stories in the global financial world. One Pakistan's lockdown started on March 23rd to try to stem the spread of COVID-19. Choices looked stark for hundreds of thousands of labourers who lost their jobs. But the government offered an attractive option to join tens of thousands of other out-of-work labourers in planting billions of trees across the country to deal with climate change threats. Thousands of unemployed day labourers, male and female, have been given new jobs as jungle workers. The ambitious five-year 10 billion tree tsunami program, which Prime Minister Imran Khan launched in 2018 to counter rising temperatures, flooding, drought and other extreme weather to compare the effects of climate change. As the coronavirus pandemic struck Pakistan, the 10 billion trees campaign initially was halted as part of social distancing orders put in place to slow the spread of the virus, which has infected over 100,000 people in Pakistan, according to the latest count. But the Prime Minister granted an exemption to allow the Forestry Agency to restart the program and create more than 63,600 jobs, according to government officials. Mohammed Tehmasib, director of the 10 Billion Tree Tsunami Project, said the work, which pays between $3.05 and $4.88 per day, Includes setting up nurseries, planting spellings, and serving as forest protection guards or forest firefighters. Laborers say it is about half of what they would usually make, but it is enough to get by in these tough times. A recent assessment by the Pakistan Institute for Development Economics Fund that due to the lockdown, up to 19 million people could be laid off. According to the World Wildlife Fund, Pakistan is a forest-poor country, where trees cover less than 6% of the total area. Every year, thousands of hectares of forests are destroyed, mainly as a result of unsustainable logging and clearing land for small-scale farming. Small-scale fishermen across Chile were up in arms over possible repeal of a law blocking roads setting fires and clashing with police. The fishermen are protesting an appeal lodged at the country's Supreme Court by a fishing company against the Skivard Law. The law prohibits the trawling of Humboldt squid, known locally as jibia. The violent protests come as the fishing industry has recently seen sharp drops in employment, with the self-employed hit particularly hard. Spaniards were hopeful the country's economy will be boosted as lockdown regulations were eased further a day earlier. Restaurant owners in Madrid hoped to increase their customer base as restrictions on indoor seating were lifted on Monday, June 8th. And customers were pleased statistics showed a plunge in new coronavirus cases. Previous rules limited customers to have filled outdoor terraces. Spain, which has suffered one of the world's worst COVID-19 outbreaks, imposed strict confinement measures in March, but has been gradually reopening its hard-hit economy since May, with different regions progressing at different speeds. Bullfights are permitted, but with attendance capped at 400. Corridors are financially unavailable for now. The panorama is bleak, said chef Elina Redigas from Mexico City's Rosetta restaurant, as Latin America's top restaurants, which soared to the top of some of world rankings in recent years, are adapting to a new reality and finding creative ways to keep the region's vibrant gastronomy culture alive. Revedas has invested in technology for deliveries, but when she finally decides to reopen Rosetta, located in the 20th century mansion, she worries that foreigners, who comprise 60 to 70 percent of her clientele, will be slow to return. Meanwhile, high-end restaurant Pujol, established by chef Enrique Olvera, has given up on its $150-plus tasting menu featuring intricate dishes 
in favor of selling baskets with produce and pantry goods from Oliveira Supplies. When Pujol does open in a couple more months, Oliveira expects it to offer just a third of the tables it once had available. In economic-stricken Argentina, Mariano Ramon, who helms Buenos Aires' fusion hotspot Grand Dabang, partnered with fellow chef Leo Lancel of neighborhood favorite Proper to offer a combined delivery menu. By putting both staffs to work in a single kitchen in shifts to ensure distancing, the chef's also longtime friends were able to cut costs and stay afloat. Orders are prepared at Proper, while Grand Bang, ranked as the 50th top restaurant in Latin America, sells wine and products from local vendors. Flexibility, Ramon said, is the key to surviving in Argentina. With no quick end in sight, restrictive measures in many countries, chefs said they have adapted in ways they've never imagined. Playing off the pandemic-induced boom in video calls, chef Marcia Taha of Gusto in La Paz, co-founded by Danish celebrity Klaus Meyer, quickly revamped her multi-course dining experience. Now she regularly posts social media tutorials on how to assemble and present the restaurant's luxurious meal kits now being delivered. As Bogota's El Chato's dining room remains shuttered, the IAT's chief owner, Alvaro Calvillo, is putting on virtual cookery classes via Zoom to accompany ingredients ordered from the restaurant by diners who are keen to cook complex dishes. As for many of his cohorts across the region, a key goal is protecting its suppliers. But it hasn't been easy, especially since much of the region is still wrestling with surging cases that make full reopening of dining rooms a distant dream, and it has seemed like a particularly cruel blow given that the region's high-end dining scene was just coming of age. Sao Paulo, the worst hit Brazilian state by the COVID-19 pandemic, remains prudent in resuming production. Since the beginning of June, most cities of Sao Paulo state lowered the grade of epidemic control and resumed businesses of real estate, office buildings, automobile dealership, retailing stores and large malls step by step, following the evidence of the state health authorities. After a three-month lockdown, reopened shops attracted crowds, and the local public transport services had over 90% of the bus routes resumed operation to support work resumption. A total of 11,800 buses ran in the city of Sao Paulo that day. To minimize the epidemic risks and work resumption, most industries that have resumed work operate no more than four hours daily of the state government's mandate and they have to evade the rush hour. All businesses must provide epidemic prevention supplies like ethyl alcohol. Customers and clerks all have to wear facial masks and maintain social distancing, and the customer flow is controlled at no more than 20% of the normal level. As early as in late May, the state government started to formulate a detailed work resumption plan. In particular, it established a five-rank system to evaluate epidemic risks in its 17 administrative regions according to the occupancy of ICU beds, infection occurrence per 10,000 residents, and other data. Most regions in the state lowered their epidemic control level in early June in the state capital Sao Paulo. Car dealership and office buildings resumed operation. Street stores and real estate brokers also resumed work. Large malls will resume operation according to the municipal government's plan. Regarding worsening infection in some inland areas after reopening, several regions that lowered their control grade have announced to resume the highest epidemic control level. The state government also made it clear that local governments must closely monitor the situation in regions where the pandemic rebounds must re-evaluate their risk levels. Review, your daily source for the most critical stories in the financial world. Tune in next time for the latest financial news impacting the world economy.